My name is Natalie. I am one of the field leads for AOC working out of the Bronx in New York. And tonight we're gonna to be speaking on organizing for powers in both our communities and the workplace. So this is our agenda for tonight. It is a packed agenda. So it is split up into two parts. Part one, we're gonna be speaking on, in, on organizing and the importance of activism. Part two, we're gonna define power. Three, we're gonna speak on the elements of organizing breaking into the roles of organizing and what does victory really look like. Part two, we're gonna be putting everything that we learned in part one into action and deciphering the process of organizing for action, what that looks like, and then finally speaking on winning and our victories. So we're gonna start off with a video um, from Dolores Huerta speaking on the importance of activism. I'm Dolores Huerta, and I am 87 years old, and I have been an activist since I was 25. That's 62 years, and I'm still going strong. I do believe that the people that are being affected by the issues are the best ones that can solve them. We started the uh, National Farm Workers Association with Cesar Chavez, which became the United Farm Workers of America, knowing that ordinary people have the power to come together to organize and that they can change policies. This is what really engaged me and really changed my life. And eventually I left being a school teacher uh, to become an organizer. The pivotal moment in my life uh, came when I met this great man named Fred Roth Sr. And I went to a meeting where he showed us uh, pictures of people who had organized themselves registering to vote, uh, elected the first Latino to the Los Angeles City Council. The most effective way uh, to make changes is by organizing, especially at the grassroots level. I call going door to door, canvassing, organizing 101, because this is where you can really engage with the voter and explain the issues to them. People get confused, and so they just throw up their hands and they don't vote. But we have to say to people, vote for what you're confident in voting, even if you have to leave some of the spaces blank. The important thing is to get in there and vote. We're seeing a new dawn of resistance, a new dawn of movements. And if we don't act responsibly, if we don't engage, then we have only ourselves to blame. Some powerful words there from powerful woman in the movement. So we're speaking on organizing. What is a social movement? Folks can enter their answer into a chat, into the chat, I'm sorry, and we'll read some out loud. So Jeremy is mentioning, of course, the Black Lives Matter movement. What are some other examples of a social movement? And what are they fundamentally Ooh. trying to do? Ooh. So I see gun control, the sunrise movement. I see trans rights, I see restorative justice. I see gun control, I see March for Our Lives, the civil rights movement. I see women's rights. Martin gave a great definition of a social movement as a collection of ideas formed by a consensus and a motivation to change the status quo. Elisha mentioned that a social movement are, is people coming together to call for change. So these are all great answers. So now let's hear from our Congresswoman on what organizing is and what it does for the movement. Now we have worked and the movement has pushed. The movement is why I was elected to Congress. The movement is why Jamal and Corey and Mondaire are here today. You all, the movement is why Ilhan is here. The movement is why Rashida is here. The movement is why Ed Markey was protected this year. 
It was the movement. Because as we've been saying since day one, they've got money, but we've got people. We've got people. At the end of the day, dollar bills don't vote, although they try to. We vote. People vote. Young people vote. And it's about time, long past time, that we recognize and understand that we owe our seats, we owe our, our political power because of young people, because of the movement for black lives, because of women, because of the working class across this country. And it's, it's a class issue, it's a race issue, it's a gender issue. That's why this work is so important. And because of the movement and the power that the movement has built, over a million calls were made in Texas alone. Over a million calls. We had calls made for, Jamal, you know how many calls were made for you in your race? Yes. How many? Sunrise overall. Yeah. Sun, 1.2 million overall, 865,000 by sunrise. There you go. <laughs> made a million calls for Jamal Bowman. So don't tell us about what young people can and can't do. So we're going to speak on now what is organizing. So organizing is the main tool that is used by the social movements to make change. A definition to consider when you're thinking of organizing is organizing is bringing the talents, resources, and skills of people in the community together to increase their collective power and to, to transform themselves and their community and workplaces for social change. Organizing is different than mobilizing and development or service work. It actually involves building relationships and consolidating perspectives, thoughts, and ideas into an organiza organizational structure. And we're going to see the, the little fishy um, the graphic whenever we speak on organizing, because it is the mentality that leads organizing. So now that we've had a more of a, dis of a discussion and more of a solid definition of organizing, what are some examples of organizing that people can think of? And please throw some in the chat. So we have a rally, we have a rally for abortion rights, we have unionization for Amazon and Starbucks, educating and empowering the communities by pro providing them tools. We have marches and protests. We have brake light clinics. We have phone banking. We have phone banking again. We have phone calls. Folks really love phone banking. We have text banking. We have protesting. We have door to door. We have, these are all examples of organizing. So these are three important things that we need to think about when we're organizing. We need to think about power, privilege, and oppression. Power is the ability that someone or something has to act. Power is not inherently good or bad, but it is how you use it and towards what end that defines it. Then you speak on privilege. Privilege is a special right advantage or an immunity granted or available only to a particular group or person. We are a lot on white privilege, gender privilege. These are examples of privileges. Then you speak on oppression and it is the state of being subjected to unjust treatment or control. Let's talk a little bit more on power. So power and organizing aims to shift the balance or to demand that somebody who has power uses their, their power to make a specific decision or change. It is not a value and it can be used for good or bad. Organizing builds power by bringing together many people. And power can be viewed as different things. It's organized people, organized money, or organized information. What kind of power do we, the people, have? So Samantha says the power to organize. Iva mentions the power to say no and stand against what we see as abuse. Aleem, the group of five, group five spoke on the power we the people have, our voices written or verbal. We have the power to vote, says Alburn. We use it, our voices to gather together and post on socials. Thomas mentions the limits and challenge of organizing due to COVID. Alex mentions the power of our voices. Tia mentions voting. Voting. I see a lot of voting. I see a lot of voices. I see Tran, uh, the re, uh, sorry, Restran mentions economic power.
Nicole mentions um, the power that we have as teachers to combat the don't say gay law. Jared mentions we have numbers. So these are all examples of power. But something that's really important that we want to make sure that we're also always speaking of is worker power. So worker power is the power that workers have. So in, in the workplace, it can often feel like we are just employees, we have no voice, right? There's a boss or there's an employer. Oftentimes it can be even these very large corporations or companies and billionaires that seem to be dictating our day-to-day -day lives. And it can feel as though we're powerless. But we have seen, especially recently, just how much worker power is and how valuable it is. So re, um, the first Starbucks to unionize is actually in our district. And it's really powerful. And we're going to hear a little bit about the, um, the workers at Starbucks and how they were able to unionize. The first unionizing Starbucks in Queens is in our district. We share our communities out there. Yeah. A multi-billion dollar corporation being challenged with workers trying to create a union corporation for unionizing. We're seeing the courage that other Starbucks workers had and other workers, service workers or workers otherwise around the world have had in the past in unionizing. Those workers are, who, who are unionizing that Starbucks, they're young like 19, 20, 21 years old. Because they saw the was set for us. They know that we stand on the shoulders of all these folks who have done this work last year and the year before and the year before that. Right now, what we have going on is actually kind of bigger than just us. It's hard for people to challenge seems very, very scary, and oftentimes it's really, really hard for, like, one person just to be, like, okay, you should do this, but it only takes, like, one or two people to really start a movement going. At the end of the day, uh, it's not a single person, or it's not a single store. It's a community. We expect that in union action, we will make our lives easier and less capricious, and generally it'll be better for everyone. I spent years working in food and bags. It's one of the most exploited industries and there's so many workers in it it's also in an incredibly low amount of work of those workplaces are union and so if we're talking about lifting and making everyone's lives better one of the most important things that we could do is unionize the hospitality and food and beverage industry like new york city's a union town starbucks service workers or service workers of another Especially for a borough like this, it would come soon for people to have the ability to bargain with their employer. I just came down here visiting from the Astoria Starbucks. Uh, One of the things that I said, I shared with them, is that you all do the work, right? That the most immediate, some of the most immediate, tangible organizing you can do is economic organizing, organizing your workplace or organizing your home, organizing your neighborhood. But then, on top of that, when you are protected at every level of your representation and elect people who actually fight for you and not people up to anyone else that they take a check from, but the people that elect them, then you can go far. You can do anything. You can, you can secure whatever you want to organize for. And the sky is the limit. So there we have an awesome example of worker power. But what does this all mean? Organizing collectively with a unified and anti-oppressive message is one of the tools that we have into achieving justice and fighting for a more just world. But there are elements in organizing that we also need to discuss in order to understand how we can move forward. And these are strategies, tactics, and wins. So a strategy. A strategy is a careful plan or method for working toward your vision, and it's usually over a sustained period of time. The skill of making or carrying out a plan by using your tactics to achieve your goal. 
So an example of a strategy would be that Amazon workers attract their colleagues one by one and include in discussions not only about Amazon, but also about civil rights, environmental justice, and working conditions. So this is the strategy that they used. Their tactic is defined as an action of a person or an organization to promote forward movement in the direction of your goal, resulting in a reaction from your target. So a couple of ways to think about it. If your strategy is the ladder, then the tactics are the steps on that ladder. Strategy and tactics, they work together. So you can think about it as you think strategically and you act tactically using again the Amazon workers. So the Amazon workers met up at the one bus stop that they all shared, and this is where they spoke to each other. This is where they recruited their coworkers into the fight. They created WhatsApp groups to inform each other and communicate goals and, pra and progress that they made on their campaign. Your wins. You define your wins in many different ways. The obvious way to define it is by getting your issue resolved. But it's also important in your campaign success, even if the specific policy hasn't, hasn't been won yet, that you built your base, you built your community, and you got further than you have before. So you're gonna be sure to celebrate all of your wins even in times that you haven't gotten exactly what you wanted. So an example that you can use for this would be the fight for 15. So there was a fight for 15 and a union. We won the $15 minimum wage in New York. However, we still are fighting to have fast food workers unionized. So although we did not get everything we wanted, it's important that we do celebrate the wins that we did achieve. Another important win that we had was the Hunts Point Market, uh, the Hunts Point Market here in the Bronx. So we're gonna hear very shortly on what that happened and how that is also a win. Yes, change happens at the ballot box. Yes, change happens in policy, but change happens on the picket line too. And we can't ever forget that. of our city's produce comes through right here, Hunts Point Market. Just in New York City alone, we feed 18 million people in restaurants, bars, nursing homes, supermarkets, your table. We have to work at night in the extreme elements sometimes, the rain, the heat, the cold, the freeze. We're here. We make sure that that stuff gets to your table in the morning. That's what we do. And they risk their lives every day to make sure that families all over New York can put food on their table. And so now I think it's time that we help these guys put food on the table for their families too. We're asking for a dollar wage because we've been here from the beginning of the pandemic. And when we approached the owners, they told us that we should be lucky to have a job. The owners don't care. They don't provide you with anything. No sanitation, no hand sanitizer, nothing. We got to bring our own. The market's never closed, and we don't miss work. We love what, what we do. We love to take care of the city. We love to feed the people of the city. So we take a private and hopefully this will impact the sport that go across the city, across the nation, and everybody stands up and fights for what they want. So there we were able to see an example of what a win for the Hunts Point market workers looked like. After standing a week on a picket, they were able to win the victory of a $1 raise. But using the examples of organizing that we've heard, we're also learning on the roles that we have as organizers. Oops, sorry. So there are three roles when you think of organizing. You have your base, your allies, and of course your decision maker. Who is your base? The base of people and or the base is the group of people or organizations who are deeply committed to your issue. Many times they're the ones that are directly impacted by your issue or serve the people who are. 
who are your allies? Your allies are the people and organizations that have similar interests on the issues. And many times these are people or organizations whose issues intersect with yours, such as housing and transportation, health and education, workplace and health. Then you have your decision maker. The decision maker is the person who can give you what you want. It is especially necessary to know who these folks are when you're working on a legislative or a city campaign. Decision makers are always people or individuals. This is not a group. For example, Representative Smith is a decision maker, not the state legislature. The decision makers are sometimes referred to also as targets. Now, everything that we've learned for today, we're gonna put it into action now. And how would that look like? How do we put everything that we've learned today of organizing, the definitions, the roles, the elements, how do we put that into action now? So when you're organizing for action, let's keep in mind that we're gonna be talking through the process, right? So we're, we're going to be talking about organizing for wage increases for the carwasheros and the, or the car wash workers in the Bronx. So this is a real life example where car wash workers here in the Bronx organized for wage increases and workplace safety. So let's keep this campaign now in the back of our minds as we talk through the process of organizing. So step one, it's to analyze, right? We are gonna identify the issues that are happening in that community. Is the group that you're bringing together representative of the community that is most impacted? Is your base represented? Who isn't at the table and how can you bring them in? And as a group, you have to identify what you see as a solution that you've determined. So as we're thinking about the car wash workers in the Bronx, unfortunately, in a very short period of time, three car wash workers mysteriously passed away. This is what brought this group of workers together. It brought the base together, right? So as a base, they were able to identify the issue that was happening in their community and the solution to that issue was improving workplace safety. Now it's time to set some short-term and some long-term goals. The, are, is the goal that you're determining or you're setting, is that a behavioral change, a legal change, or an institutional change? And who are going to be the key players that are involved in this issue? Who has the power to make the change and who is your target? So when we're speaking on the car wash workers, their goal was to improve workplace safety. So this is a behavioral change. It also included legal changes. And it could, and if you want to take it all the way up, it could, it, it could include also institutional changes. Who were the key players that were involved in this issue? Of course, the car wash workers and the owner of these car washes. Who had the power to make that change? The power to make that change was held by the car wash own, work, the car wash owners, right? They were the ones that could improve workplace safety. They were the ones that, that could improve and increase wages for these workers. So they also became our target because they held that power. Step two, you're going to plan. Again, you're going to develop a strategy that is going to help you achieve your goal. This plan could include informing the public, identifying the base and the allies, encouraging people to take action. So we're going to think about these car wash workers, right? Their strategy included reaching out to the media reaching out to, to, the, to social media, reaching out to the press, reaching out to their community where that car wash was located and letting folks know what was happening there, right? They encouraged people to either stop going to that car wash 
or to put pressure on their boss, right? To hold their boss accountable. In your planning phase, you're gonna also identify the tactics in your strategy. How are you going to execute your strategy? What are the steps that are gonna be involved in you meeting the goals of your strategy? For example, if you wanna build your base, you're gonna hold meetings. If you wanna influence a lawmaker, you're, you could do a letter writing campaign. You can have a rally. You can have phone banking. We heard of phone banking. We heard of door-to-door -door canvassing, right? But it's also going to be important that to identify the roles in these strategies. So who's going to be doing the door knocking? Who is going to be the speaker at the rally? And who is going to create the messaging and the flyer around this rally? And finally, step three, your action. Now that you've got your plan, you're ready to jump into action and actually carry out your strategy. But it's going to be really important that along the way, you keep track of your timeline and your milestones, because this is going to change depending on the tactics that you use and depending on the organizing conditions, it's going to, it's, it's, it's going to be adaptable and things are going to be thrown in where you're going to have to be ready to move these milestones and move your timeline. And finally, after all your action is done and after you get home from your rally or your door knocking day or your petitioning rally, you're going to reflect. Reflection is super important, right? And you need to do this as a group so you can talk through your action, right? What did this action achieve? Did we build our base? Did we build our community? Did we win? Did we develop an effective strategy? Are we closer to achieving our vision? What did we learn? What was successful? And what is something that we can do better with time? Of course, you're gonna remember to always celebrate your wins. You're gonna celebrate the success of your short-term goals. And you're also gonna celebrate the success of your, your long-term goals. You're gonna celebrate the fact that you're coming together in your community to resist these unjust power structures and fight for a more, a more just society. Do not limit yourself to just this narrow view of a win. We spoke about this earlier. You may not get all of your wins, right, immediately. It's important to celebrate along the way the wins and the victories that you do achieve. Whether that's you build your base, you have more people speaking on the issue. You have, you know, inst in, instead of having just you and your coworkers know about what's going on in your workplace, now you have the whole community knowing what's going on in your workplace. This is also a win. And to speak about those, that fact, and before we close or we wrap it up, we're going to hear a little bit about what the uh, Congresswoman has to say about strong communities. We need to fight for change at every single level, local, city, state, and federal. And that's what movement politics are all about. What we're doing today, collecting signatures to get on the ballot. What this is really about is about knocking on our neighbor's door or talking to our friends outside of the bodega or outside of the bank or outside of the subway station. And the, the reason why that's important is that, is that strong communities talk to each other. We say, hey man, what's up? I, let me just tell you something that we really need. Today is about collecting signatures, but tomorrow you may be knocking on your neighbor's door, asking them to join a tenant's union. Or the day after that, it may be about organizing to make sure that we fight for more resources for our schools. Or the day after that, it may be because like what happened right after COVID, we would knock, I knocked on, on the doors of my building to figure out where our seniors were and see if we could get the young people to go to the grocery store for them so that they didn't have to be exposed to needless <laughs> that, Right? But these types of practices, 
And becoming a place where we're used to engaging in that is how we build a better, stronger community that can get what we need. And so I wanna thank you all for doing that. This is a baby step. This is a practice in doing that. But, you know, think of this as just one of many steps necessary to really improve all of our lives. So I thank you all so, so very much. And let's get to it. Let's get so we want folks to take what you learned and discuss it here and apply it to your workplace and your community. So we've had, we have a worker's pledge and this is the link that I will, oh, that I will share through, um, that I will share through and let folks see, go to the link. This is what it looks like. You can download and print the toolkit that I just showed you. And this is something that you can do immediately. So all those issues that were brought up in the chat, this is how we can, this is how we can combat them. And of course, join Team AOC. You can sign up for events. We are holding deep canvassing trainings. We are uh, holding summer sessions three and four, and we are holding remote phone banks where we are speaking on these issues and we're having conversations with folks on how we can help combat them in our communities.